or serious issues? Do you see it that way? I do. I agree with the president that there, that there are a lot of issues in here. It's complex. They're extenuating circumstances. But if we're going to err, we should err on the side of life and make sure uh, that Terry has and her family has their day in court to make sure that she has every right afforded to her under the Constitution. What would you like to know that you don't know in this case if you were trying to decide it? Well, I think first off, there is there's disagreement on whether or not uh, Terry had expressed. There's no written agree. There's no written evidence that she said she would not want to be kept alive by being given food or water. Uh, it's simply her, her husband, her estranged husband, has made those statements. Her family has said uh, she would have wanted to be kept alive. And so I think I, her mother said she doesn't know. She did not make it. And unfortunately, many people at that age do not make those right. statements and do not make it very clear. Let me ask you, uh, Mr. Perkins, if you knew there's a difference here, and I think there is a difference in the arguments here, and as we've all put, learned, these, everybody seems to have a point of view in this, and the facts seem to change. The argument from most of the doctors, maybe not all of them, but most of them is that this woman is in something of a, I hate this word, vegetative state, meaning she doesn't have an awareness of her own existence, of the world around her. The other argument is that she is in a, uh, obviously, handicapped state with serious brain damage, but she does have an emotional life. This is Jim Hatt, not Jim Hatcher, but Jim Sensenbrenner, the, who was the floor manager last night, said she has an emotional life. She has emotional responses to the presence of her parents. Does that matter, that distinction to you? Mr. Oh, it Perkins? does, absolutely. And I think Senator Bill Frist on the, on the Senate floor spoke to some of those involved in the case, the doctors as a medical prof uh, professional, and said that uh, there, is, there is conflicting diagnosis right. on her. But does it matter to you, for example, if she is emotionally alive or she's not intellectually or emotionally alive, would you give more power to her uh, spouse to make the decision? I think there, without getting into all the, the extenuating circumstances with her, with her estranged husband. Right, we know that he's living with another woman. He has children with the other woman. He's obviously leading something of a complicated life. Let's put it that way. Right, and, and without going into all that, but just to say that there are, there are factors that would question whether or not he's going to act in the best interest of Terry. But if he were a good, upstanding guy, and would you leave him the, the decision in this case? I think if I think it would have been easier for him to have made his case if there were none of these extenuating factors that. But he for you, sir, Mr. Perkins, would you let him make the judgment if he passed muster as a seemingly good moral husband who took primary concern over her? If if he spoke with a uh, with confidence that she had said she did not want to be kept alive in this manner, I think we would have to respect that. If okay. there were not these other. I get you. I get fair enough. Let me go right now to Jim Wallace. Your ethics on this. It's, I just wonder if you need to know more information, or you want to have to choose besides, or it's just a factor of some people believe you have to do everything you can to keep every person on this planet alive as long as you can. Pat Buchanan took that view last night here. Chris, Pretty this, simply, this, that was this his view. This is such a sad, sad story, and most of us don't know enough about it to be talking about it as much as we are, or voting on it last night. How about the guys uh, last night who couldn't even pronounce her name? Yeah, so who didn't even bother to check out how you pronounce her name. The Catholic Conference of Florida said, where there is scientific ambiguity, it's the morally safe course to err on the side of life. But are we erring that's on the, the side? Is there a real issue here, though? That's the, well, what do we don't know. Do you believe there's a question here, still at large, or do you believe it's pretty clear that this woman is in a vegetative state? You know, <laughs> How, how can I know, or mo most Americans know, what is so complicated, personal, there is conflicting diagnosis of husband and her parents are opposed. But the doctors are, and all, now it's are in pretty Congress. much on one side, aren't they? Well, so, uh, well I, I, I've heard conflict, conflicting views, but now it's in Congress, and my concern here, well, I, I, I want to err on the side of life, too, but this has become so political. This is now a very political case, and I'm hearing memos about this is a good way to go after Senator Bill Nelson. He's an evangelical Christian. What kind of, how has this woman's case, so sad, become so political? John Meacham, your editor of Newsweek, I want to mention, I want to ask you the same question I asked Tim Ruster at the top of the show. If you're trying to write the history of this, 2005, how did Terry Schiavo become a federal case? Is it religion? Is it the cultural war we're in right now? Is it just simple re-election politics, or is it deep moral commitment here? Keep going. You're on a roll. I think it's all of those things. I really do. I, I think it's remarkable, and I agree with Jim completely, that I, don't th I certainly don't know enough to talk about this case in the way that uh, a lot of members of Congress were talking about it last night. I do think that the, the central question that's raised about this is a question of the definition of life and the quality of life. Now, the uh, Roman Catholic Church, for instance, your church, would say that 
we are all created in God's image, that we must do everything we can to preserve that gift of God unto the, unto the very, very end. There is another ethical question raised about at what point does that life become so difficult to maintain that the proper, just, merciful, charitable thing to right. do is to end it. That, if there's anything that this case does outside of that particular family in Florida, and God bless them and, and Godspeed as they deal with this, all of them, it is that we should have an intelligent, sensible, dignified, quiet conversation about the definition of life. I have to tell you, though, John, I went to 16 years of Catholic school, and what we were taught in grade school and onward, especially in high school, I recall, it, that you didn't have to go to extraordinary means to keep a person alive. Now, of course, you get to the definition. Is intravenous feeding and intravenous right. hydration extraordinary means? Well, I read some uh, papers today that say that it is in certain cases. Extraordinary to keep, for example, a person in deep dementia, in the extreme... Uh, outer limits of, uh, of Alzheimer's disease, that they all totally at the end, when you're headed, headed toward the fetal position. If at that point you continue to feed and hydrate a person, is it, it is an extraordinary effort. It is. I, and I would say, on, my, on very personal grounds, speaking solely for myself, thinking theologically, because I do believe we're all created in God's image, and I do believe we have obligations uh, beyond time and space, I think it, when you get to a certain point, Yes, the, the, the life as one understands it, life as we've been given the ability to perceive it, ends. And science should not prolong that uh, beyond that certain point. But that is a case-by-case, -case, personal, family decision. You know what? I think this is one time I'd like to see a secret ballot on Capitol Hill. Let people yeah, vote their consciences and stop the politics. We'll be right back with Newsweek's John Meacham, Tony Perkins, and Jim Wallace to talk about the role of faith in American politics overall. And don't forget... Sign up for Hardball's daily email briefing. Just log on to our website, hardball.msnbc.com. We're back with Newsweek Managing Editor John Meacham, Jim Wallace, the editor of Sojourners and the author of God's Politics, and the Family Research Council's president, Tony Perkins. This is a very small segment, but we've got to get a lot done here about the impact of Christianity on Western civilization and the world. John Meacham, how did it happen that Christianity... God's will, of course, and providence, but tell me the mechanics of how Christianity spread to two billion people. Well, very quickly, uh, essentially the disciples thought after the crucifixion that the story was over, uh, that Jesus had been a prophet of the kingdom of God, a kingdom that was going to come that Passover in about the year 30. They have the resurrection uh, experience. The women go to the tomb. They find it empty. They return. The disciples don't believe them at first. They dismiss it as an idle tale. And then Jesus appears to the disciples, and according to St. Paul, 500, uh, lots of people for a time. And in that redefinition of Messiah, which is what happened after the resurrection, there was no one expecting a Messiah just this way. So the disciples of Jesus, the early followers, including Paul, who had been a persecutor of the church, decided that they had actually ex experienced something entirely unique. And it was a message uh, which appealed to the human condition, the human heart, the human mind, in that life came out of death, light out of darkness, uh, strength out of weakness. Mm. And in that, in emotional way, uh, it had a certain power. Sociologically, it's quite interesting. The uh, number of Christians went from about 0.0017% of the Roman Empire in the year 40 to 56.5% uh, by the time yeah. Constantine converted. It's a nice point uh, in a political sense. We often think that Constantine converted and the empire went with him. I think he was just reading the numbers uh, yeah. and began to make that shift. I've always liked him for that reason, though. <laughs> I'm sure he was a cruel guy, but I always liked Constantine for coming aboard. Let me ask you, Jim Wallace, how do you explain the phenomenon? It wasn't a church, it was a movement. It was the spread of a movement. They were called at first the people of the way, the way of Jesus. And it was a radical way. It brought you know, they were women and men together. They were being persecuted. They were being the crucified, poor, right. executed uh, uh, in every means. They were the most unpopular people. It how did they become, how did they turn the, turn the tide? They had faith and bet their lives on it. And finally, the empire had to deal with them because they were the movement. So that, that was, was the first case everything. in which religion affected politics. Oh, well, sure. It, it was a political threat. It was a bringing together the poor were welcome, women were welcome. It was a radical Gutsy social people. movement. It Gutsy sure was. people. Let me go to Tony Perkins. Your sentiments and thoughts about the beginnings of Christianity. Well, yeah. I would agree with what has been said, but I would say that it's a powerful message 
of hope and purpose that transforms individual lives. It gives people something to guide them that uh, does, they're, they're not uh, persuaded by opposition. They're not detracted by those who would speak evil of them. They stay the course, and that's why they make a difference. It's because they, they're, they're not uh, blown off course by the, the winds of change. Do you think it's important, uh, Tony, that they did manage to become a majority in that Roman Empire in those days, those early centuries of Christendom? Well, I, I think it is, and I think we've seen the impact that Christian Christianity has had throughout uh, all of Western civilization. It's been a, a, sled, a, a slow but steady growing process uh, that to this day continues to, uh, to impact this world. But I would say when the state embraced them, the movement power was diminished, and they wouldn't fight in, in, in the armies of Rome. They wouldn't yeah. join the army. They were well, they were committed to the nonviolence of Jesus, and that changed. So I think lots of things change about the We're going to talk movement. about a whole show about Martin Luther sometime. But there's a fascinating <laughs> talk about a guy with guts. John Meacham, what was his role? Well, obviously leading the Protestant Reformation, which I know you're still upset about, uh, and clearly understanding that, in fact, the church had become one would argue that the uh, Roman Catholic Church had become too insular, uh, had become too much obsessed with its own traditions. Luther pushed for a return to scripture, for a, a, a kind of reformation going back to the origins of something. We see this again and again in history. Thank you, John Meacham, Jim Wallace, and Tony Perkins. When we come back, Saturday Night Live plays hardball. Watching Hardball, part of the best primetime in cable news.